Hello and welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Juma Iraqi. And today I've brought back a very popular guest. He's been on the show two times before. So, Mike Isretel, how are you doing today? This is the third Good. time. Good. Yeah, Sorry, been, go ahead. It's been a long time since we last talked. I think the last podcast we did was October 2016. And I've been getting tons of requests to bring you back. So thank you so much for taking the time to do another podcast with uh, with me. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Um, I can't wait to get into ranting and maybe some intellect will come out of that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, before we start, this podcast is available on YouTube. But if you want to find it in audio format, you can also find it on iTunes, SoundCloud and Stitcher as well. So, Mike, today's topic is uh, we're, we're basically going to talk about bodybuilding and um, talk about some of the myths and talk a little bit about training and nutrition related to uh, bodybuilding and muscle growth. But for people that haven't heard uh, our previous two episodes, could you please give us a short, um, uh, short description about it yourself? Yeah, totally. Um... I used to be a professor of sport and exercise science for a while. I have a PhD in sport physiology, and I've consulted various uh, athletes and um, Olympic bodies on nutrition and sport nutrition and stuff like that. And I currently work for Renaissance Periodization, which is a company I co-founded some number of years ago with Nick Shaw. And uh, we provide nutritional and training services, write books and make templates and all this other kind of stuff and coach a whole bunch of clients. And um, I have uh, also in in a sort of lifetime involved in athletics myself. I'm a competitive bodybuilder, which is something I'm not very good at yet, but I'm trying to get better. And I'm I'm actually a professional uh, jiu-jitsu grappler. Um, So that's kind of cool. So I do jiu-jitsu and bodybuilding and I uh, definitely try to live the life, and in my spare time, I write books and stuff like that about nutrition. We're actually rewriting the original, very successful Renaissance diet. It's going to be a new book altogether, uh, and it's going to cover uh, much more than the old one did, including a lot of diet psychology type of stuff. So super pumped, and uh, basically my my job in general, in, in large part, has, basic, has been turned into – being sort of a public intellectual for science and reason in the training and diet communities. And we need a whole lot of science and reason in those communities because yeah. there's a whole lot of the opposite. Yeah. And for people that uh, don't already follow you on social media, I highly rec- recommend that you check uh, Mike Israel out on Facebook and Instagram as well. Um, all right, Mike. So today's topic is uh, I termed it bodybuilding science. So we'll talk about some myths, some training, and some nutrition. So let's start off with the first question. So of all the myths that are in the bodybuilding and fitness industry related to training and nutrition, what would you say is the worst one? Yeah, I I already um, ranted about this excessively before the recording. Yeah. So now that I have my thoughts well summarized, it'll come off a bit cleaner. I think this is kind of um, an aggregate of a bunch of myths. It's kind of a mega myth. It's like if the myths had a big robot that they combined to make and try to destroy the world, this would be it. So the myth is that the best results that you can get in training and diet lie in the new cool thing. What's the new thing, right? This new fad, these new biohacks some kind of tricks that people are looking for. And people always, 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 on average, not everyone, uh, but too many people tend to want the edge. And there's nothing wrong with wanting the edge. But when the edge isn't built upon a foundation of fundamentally good things, then you end up in a, a situation where you're missing the fundamentals just trying to rely on tricks and that's just really not going to get you anywhere like if you're i don't know an analogy here is if you're designing a a rocket that's supposed to travel around the world by itself totally computer guided 
you know, you can really try to get the best guidance system you can and that uses a new kind of guidance that relies on actually like, you know, the stars as opposed to the earth or something. Um, that's cool. But if you don't know anything about constructing the engine or the, the, the parts of the engine that move around so that the rocket can actually point itself in a different way, just real basic stuff that, you know, the first rocket engineers in the forties already had down, you're just not going to be building a rocket that fucking goes anywhere. So, but if you already know and have the basics down, then some of the new navigation technologies might be worth your while. But, you know, of all the different experiments that are done in navigation technologies, most fail. Just the same way with all the new tricks in dieting that people propose, most simply aren't very effective. Can you detect the effective ones? Yes, but they're almost always a really small part of an effective approach built on fundamentals. It's this idea that, like, you know, it, it, how do I, how do I, how is this myth presented to me? Well, as sort of a, a person, people ask questions a lot about bodybuilding and stuff, and how to get lean and how to get muscular. People will say things like, "Hey, what do you think about keto? What do you think about intermittent fasting? What do you think about one set to failure workouts? You know, what do you think about German volume training?" These are just memes to people. They're words. A lot of the people that ask this kind of stuff have no understanding of the general structure. Um, it's like asking, you know, somebody who's a car buff, you know, what do you think about this, the supercharger? And he's going to look and you'll be like, you have, you have like a stock Honda Civic. And he's like, what the hell do you need a supercharger for? And you're like, well, I don't know. I heard it's like really it's going to make my car fast. Well, nothing's going to make your car fast. You have a four-cylinder engine, produces 120 horsepower. Like you need a new car, right? You need to take the engine out, put in a Mustang engine, something, right? So I think a lot of people who are looking for big changes are looking in the wrong place with these little diet hacks. What should they be looking for instead? Rational advice, reasonable advice, uh, starting with books and basic videos that just to describe a calorie deficit, getting enough protein, spreading things out through multiple meals of the day, with weight training, understanding the relationship of intensity and volume to progression, how to do compound basic exercise with good technique, how to build a basic program. Once you know that stuff, you got like 80 or 90% of all your best gains already. And then if you ask, well, what about this cool new trick? You already understand that the cool new trick just enhances something just a tiny little bit, right? Like if uh, in the UFC world, if Conor McGregor wanted to add a new like punch or new kick to his arsenal, that would make sense because he's already really, really good at fighting. He understands the basics of fighting. But if you just take some kid off the street that comes into an MMA gym and be like, hey, can you guys teach me that new kit Conor McGregor's doing? Like, yeah, if you want to get killed, we can teach it to you because you don't know anything else. You can't fit it into a framework and you're going to be disappointed year after year, decade after decade because you have new people coming in. You know, older folks usually don't fall for this kind of stuff, people that have been in the industry for a while. But you always have new folks, um, it, not just younger folks, people who maybe ignored their nutrition and, and health and their, their body for uh, up until they were 40 years old. They come in. What, what looks most seductive are the tricks. That's what they go for. And the boring people that you and me and the scientific community have to kind of just take them away from that and be like, I know the tricks look cool, but this is a bit of a waste of time. And it's a huge myth. A lot of people profit from it. Just, to, you know um, – to call out somebody in person who's never going to see this if he does great you know dr oz do you know who that is Juma? Yeah, yeah i mean dr oz's show is essentially a compilation of myth after myth after cool trick after cool trick what do you think about raspberry ketones like this is one of the first people to mention raspberry ketones because it was like the thing people were talking about right if you if you listen to eric helms podcast how many times are they going to mention cool new tricks like never you just you're going to be you're going to be listening to the thing and you're going to be like well, there's nothing 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 cool here at all it's just science and it's boring well that's how you really make results you know and and, and unfortunately dr oz has a little bit more of a reach than eric helms we're trying to change that but that's the way it is and that's why i think it's one of the really big myths excellent I, and i i totally agree and I I think one of the issues that a lot of people that are getting into lifting uh, is the is the fear of what I'm currently doing now might not be the most optimal. So they think a lot in black and white terms that this is either going to give me massive results or it's not going to give me results at all. Totally. It actually, this is kind of interesting to admit, I'll see what you make of it, but uh, you know, Renaissance Periodization has become a really, really big company, um, and we've managed to help a lot of people. Um, and, you know, we get a lot of feedback. The feedback that I'm often a little bit uncomfortable with, I think it's great, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable with is, man, nothing worked for me until I tried RP, and now I have amazing results. And it's just like, fuck, 
what the fuck were you doing? Like, we don't have any crazy fucking secrets. Like, did you ever try eating a hypocaloric diet to lose fat? And then the answer is to them, no. Like, they tried every fad that wasn't hypocaloric. They're like, intermittent fasting, but I eat 3,000 calories per meal. Uh, you know, keto, but I eat, like, bacon with ranch and chicken on top and all this other shit. And you're like, oh, okay. But it's just really crazy to me when people are like, nothing worked until I tried this thing. I'm like, man, you're very uncommon. Most people, the stuff works, but something could be working a little bit better. And, and one really quick thing just got me thinking about what you said. It's fine to want the optimal, but there is a really big precondition in almost every case, and this actually in, in almost every intellectual application you can think of, to derive optimality requires an intimate measurement and knowledge of the exact system you want to optimize. So, like, for example, if you have a country that is maybe a new country, just liberated or whatever, and they hire a group of economists to design their um, uh, system of economics to make sure that it generates wealth over the long term. What are the economists going to do is you could do a really basic system, like mostly market system with a couple of, you know, safety net stuff, really high trade freedom, all this other stuff, just proven basics that make every country more wealthy. How are they going to – now, if the, if the person who's in charge says, okay, now I want you to optimize it, all of the economists pretty much are going to be like, look, we need time to figure out how your country works, how the markets respond. Then we're going to optimize it once we really have tried the basics for a long time when we see kind of the topography of what's going on. So when people are like, hey, it's my first time lifting – I want to optimize shit. Like, we don't know how you respond. Like, if we know that your maximum recoverable volume is around 20 sets per week, we can start to optimize to see if it's really maybe like more like 22 or maybe more like 18. But if you literally have no idea what your MRV is, you can't optimize. You know what I mean? Like, how do you optimize a race car? You take it around the track 50 fucking times, you measure everything, and then you start being like, okay, so what's wrong here is the torque is a little too high, the horsepower, this, that, right? But if you just don't know anything about your body and you're coming in cold, you're asking about optimization. It's literally not enough information to give you that. So, so what, the only thing you can ask for when you just come to diet or training is a fundamentally good plan. Based on how you respond to that plan and you've got to measure things carefully and you've got to really be mindful of what's going on, then we can start the long, painful, and for most people, completely useless quest of optimization, <laughs> right? You know, somebody – what's the difference between an optimized person? You know, optimized means you take off your shirt – you know, at a, at, a, at a pool party and you're 10% fat versus 11.5. Who gives a shit? You know what I mean? That's optimization. On a bodybuilding stage, it means everything, right? On, in a normal setting, it means almost nothing at all. So fundamentally, if you have like, like people, um, I don't know if you've seen this, um, Kino body. You're familiar with Kino body? Yeah. Jimmer? Greg, so uh, like, Greg O'Gallagher. Yeah. And he's yeah. a lot of fad bullshit and intermittent fasting is like, this is uh, going to be amazing. And it looks like a, like a cult of vampires or some shit like that. But like, Fundamentally, what is he saying? You don't, you know, you're trained with really compound, heavy, basic exercises that hit a lot of muscle mass. You do plenty of drop sets to economize on time. You only do this several times a week. You do a hypocaloric diet fundamentally. You control your calories through fasting, and you keep track on macros and protein, and 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 you'll get a, a pretty good looking body with minimum investment. He's fucking right. Like he's for sure right now. Is it optimized? No, but most of the guys that will buy that kind of keto body. They don't want optimization. They just want to look fucking jacked and still be able to, I don't know, bang hookers or whatever it is they're selling. I don't even know whatever lifestyle they're selling, right? Still be able to drink or whatever at night. So that's totally cool. So I think a lot of people that even ask about optimization, you have to re-ask them like, are you sure that's what you want? Because you know they'll be like, I want to optimize. But okay, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? They're like five. We're like, well, oh, your quest for optimization is already like pointless. And they're like, oh, fuck. How yeah. about we just start you with a good plan, get you in good shape, then we can think about great shape later because it doesn't matter what plan you have. you got to get to good before you get to great. It, it's like – and people don't do this in other realms. Like you don't come to a middle school basketball practice and go, coach, I want to be in the NBA eventually. you got to coach me right for that. Be like, what the fuck are you talking about? How about you start leading the scores in middle school first? Then we'll talk about NBA. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of us in fitness and nutrition really need to kind of mind that sort of approach. Yeah, yeah. I totally, I totally agree. And that brings me to – the next question, which is on training, because this is an area where people will say you're an idiot for training like this because this way is more optimal. So when we're talking about training frequency, you'll see typically a lot of bodybuilders, they'll train each muscle group once a week. But the question is, can you still gain any muscle on that? Because I think I feel that a lot of people in the industry get the impression that 
Training once a week is a complete waste of time and it won't lead to any gains because two or three or higher frequency seems to be better. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, I think that um, uh, so training once a week, I think in the most extreme cases is only 50% as effective as training multiple times a week. Mm hmm. That's in the most extreme cases, which are you have an individual that require, recovers incredibly rapidly due to some combination of factors, right? Um, you have an individual whose muscle groups are small, right, more slow twitch, um, and or they're targeting small muscle groups preferentially, right? So people say, like, my biceps never started to grow until I was training three days a week. Well, you know, yeah, biceps heal really fast, so training them once a week is kind of insane. But – you know, for those kinds of extreme cases, I think you can get a pretty good response from training once a week. In most situations, it just it'll be much better if you train with higher frequency. But that, usually, that's not the case for average size, average strength individuals that have been training for a couple of years. If they have bigger chest, legs, back, that kind of stuff, there comes a trade-off there where you can train really hard if you only train once a week, which gives you some cool adaptations. But you're resting for a bit too long, which means you're missing out a little. The two tend to balance out quite a bit so that you're maybe getting only 80% of the gains that you would be otherwise. 80% of the gains is a lot of fucking gains. Mm -hmm. So you absolutely can make gains. And most of the bodybuilding community makes great gains training once a week. The the secret – not not the secret that nobody – I was going to phrase that very poorly. The interesting phenomenon about evidence-based versus bro people – is that the bros are usually doing okay. They're pretty jacked. <laughs> so it, it is not just steroids, right? You got a lot of, I know a lot of natural bros that are like, you know, people who go out clubbing in New York City. Like, they're pretty fucking jacked, like for normal people that train four days a week. And, um, you know, they're not the ones struggling. I do think that there's a small subset of individuals that really struggle on lower frequencies for any number of factors, usually because they recover so quickly. These individuals tend to benefit much more from higher frequency training. They are the ones that yell at the rooftops about how low frequency is stupid. Most people just don't have that same experience, nor do they care. So when people say try high frequency, they're like, Mah, whatever, my program works fine. But of course, there is the problem that I think you're intimating here is that um, people who are having okay gains once a week training or twice a week, they hear these rooftop yellers about you got to train six times a week or four times a week, every muscle group. And they go, oh, fuck, that's what's going to make me an IFB pro. And they try it. Sometimes they don't adjust their per session volumes. They overreach or it's just an uh, just unimpressive level of gains. And all of a sudden they're pissed and who the fuck lied to them about training frequency. But yeah, I think one time a week training – uh, it was going to work pretty well for most people, especially for beginners, especially for smaller individuals, especially for females. Yes, higher frequencies are going to be better, but it's definitely not all or nothing. And while I'm on the subject, because you might uh, ask me this anyway, how much better is training three times a week for a muscle group than, than two times a week? Already, per the average muscle group, it's barely uh, detectable. For something like chest, legs, back, which re require a lot of homeostatic disruption every time you train them, they require a lot more rest. Uh, and so two times a week might be maxed out for those, actually. And if you try to train them three times a week, you might actually be altering your training design uh, just to accommodate that much training and no longer searching for optimality. For muscle groups that are smaller, biceps, side delts, calves, things like that, maybe three times a week is better. Maybe even four times a week is notably better than twice a week. But those are the small muscle groups that you know, you're know you not exactly going to detect in scientific studies. Like You're not going to gain LBM in your bicep and it's going to show up on the total. That's fucking crazy, right? That's like a half a pound or whatever it's within the margin of error so um like as you get into uh you know three versus four times a week i mean you're finding almost no differences uh five six times a week and you're gonna have to design a study very interestingly to do that so i think that um two time a week training should really be the industry default for beginners and then you can play with more frequency but i think with two times a week you're getting such a broad swath of individuals of various recovery capacities that I think it's a really good place to start. <coughs> yeah, I would totally I would totally agree with that. And my point with it was this was I think a lot of people get confused with with the whole frequency thing uh, regarding like you'll hear people say, well, um, everything that's not training each muscle group every time like a full body split every time is a bro split. There's actually some people that ha that say that. Uh, and and like I tell them that 
if let, let's say you take a bro split and you train each muscle group once a week if you over time get stronger and do that for like five six seven years you're going to get results from that as well but it might be not it might not be the most optimal thing to do but you're still going to get results uh, results from that i think it's very important i think your point is very important for at least one reason and here's the reason if you tell people that hey look i think you're going to have slightly better um progress with a more high frequency plan they're going to be like oh, okay they're going to try it they're going to notice that you said the truth and they're going to tell other friends and then your popularity is going to grow and then the right way is going to be more practiced if you tell people like you're an idiot you're a bro your approach doesn't work they know five guys in the gym with chests bigger than the guy who's saying this that train chest once a week mm -hmm. they're automatically going to be like well you're fucking retarded there's no way i'm just not listening to you it's a bad. It's a bad way to do things. Like, and you get there's a lot of evidence-based folks like this huge anti-bro attitude, especially in online debates. You click on a motherfucker's profile, he weighs like 65 kilos. You're like, I don't even. That's nice, but you know, let's see some size first, right? And you know, inevitably, it's like, well, it's all steroids, right? Okay, yeah. that's nice. Uh, so you know, uh, and it's funny because um, Brad Schoenfeld uh, was involved in a study in which they uh, took uh, examined the training practices of natural bodybuilders, they just ask them how often they train body parts, the, by a long shot, the average was once a week, right? And, and, and then some of them did twice a week and almost nobody did the same muscle group three times a week. Yeah. Uh, these are natural bodybuilders. So it's yeah. kind of like, man, you know, the best naturals even don't train like some of these sort of gurus are supposed to, you're supposed to train all the fucking time. And, and there's probably some advantages of high frequency training, especially in certain circumstances. You just can't oversell it. Because as soon as you oversell it, people just stop believing you. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, moving forward to the next question regarding another training question. When it comes to failure training, you seem to have two camps. Like some people say you should never go to failure and some people say you should always go to failure on your, at least on your last set for each uh, exercise. But how can you, in, in a smart way, incorporate failure training into your program like how are you supposed to use it as a tool well there's a variety of ways to use it as a tool before we get into those we have to understand what the tool is what the advantages and disadvantages are training to failure almost certainly causes more hypertrophy per unit of training than not training to failure so if you do one set to failure versus one set not to failure that's all you do and then you measure hypertrophy almost certainly the set to failure is going to give you more hypertrophy. That's the, the plus side. So there's definitely plus side. The minus side is it's going to give you more fatigue. Now, the thing is training to failure does not give you linearly more fatigue. So for example, if you get four reps away from failure versus three reps versus two reps versus one rep versus failure, it's not like you get like 1.25 times more fatigue that entire time. So like, um, you know, if you do uh, 10 reps, versus 12 reps, and the 12 reps is at failure, and the 10 reps is two from fail, you don't get a quarter more fatigue, right? Or sorry, uh, point, uh, point 0.20 more fatigue, 20% more fatigue. If you do 20% more volume, you think you get 20% more fatigue. You don't. You get maybe like 50% more fatigue or even 80% more fatigue. The closer you approach failure, fatigue after, as a consequence of that set, rises exponentially. So... If gains rise linearly and fatigue rises exponentially, we have a trade-off there. And that trade-off usually doesn't occur on average at failure. So, so basically another way of saying this is if all of your workouts are to failure every set for weeks and weeks and weeks, you are willfully saying, I, I am okay with getting way more fatigue than I need to be getting for just a little bit more growth. That doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. On the other hand... If you train way too far away from failure, so somebody could say this advice and be like, okay, great, I'm going to stop 10 reps short of failure. Unfortunately, the repetitions in reserve get too high. It has been shown that you don't get the same level of hypertrophic stimulus. And if reps in reserve are too high for especially intermediates and above, you get almost no hypertrophy. Like if you put your 20 RM on the bar and you did sets of five and you did enough sets of five to do the equivalent of three three times 20 RM, and another group did three times 20 RM, same volume, you would see markedly less growth, much less growth in advanced trainees 
uh, with the sets of five because you never really disrupt homeostasis, right? I mean, you're doing tons of sets of five, and every time the experimenters come up to you, they're like, how did that feel? You're like, it felt fucking easy as hell. I, I'm, like, warming up for a long time, right? Just the same way that, like, walking 15 miles simply does not get you the same uh, um, kind of uh, stimulus as running 10 miles, right? You run 10 miles, it's actually less volume, but if you multiply it by the intensity, it might be the same number of calories burned, right? Same number of calories burned, but you get these crazy awesome aerobic adaptations from running 10 miles. If you walk 15 miles, I mean, like, there's old ladies that walk their fucking dog 15 miles a day, you know what I mean? Like, you're not, you're not building a championship endurance. So both ends of the spectrum consistently getting too close to failure, probably too much fatigue for our time. The other end of the spectrum, we're just not training hard enough to make the best gains. Now, fatigue is not going to be an issue at all, but neither is adaptation. We don't go to the gym to just do sets of five for no fucking reason, so we're going to have to pick a range. Here's the range. Anything between roughly four repetitions in reserve and actual failure training is a very productive hypertrophy range. Can we always stay – so some people say, well, let's just stay about two reps short of failure, and that's a good trade-off. I would say that at any one time, that's a good way to approach things, right? So if you're like, you're not running a periodized plan, you run and you have to get a good workout. You still got workouts later that week. You got workouts later that month, so you can't just blow your load. I say keeping everything two reps shy of failure is a real good baseline. But here's the real way to think about it. If you're constructing a mesocycle, you know that you're going to have an accumulation phase. It's going to be followed by some way of deloading. Here's what you do. You, you have to apply overload. Things have to get harder every microcycle or else you're not you're violating the overload principle and you're just not going to be making your fastest gains. So how do you take that with failure? Well, if you just do two reps shy of failure every time, you're going to have to like reduce your volumes after a certain while or not be able to add reps and uh, weight to the bar because you're simply not going to be able to keep going too shy of failure. So uh, how do you go about this? You might start your first week, keep four reps in the tank. Your second week, three reps. Your third week, two reps. Your fourth week, one rep in the tank slash failure deload, repeat, or something to that extent. So as your mouse cycle continues, you get a closer proximity to failure, and that's it. Um, you are still, let's check the boxes. Are you always in the relative intensity range that is generally productive? Yep, four reps of failure or above. Are you producing overload every time? Yep. What is the average uh, reps to failure d during that entire time? Well, about two, which is our, our thumbs up value. And do you still get to use the superpowers of training to failure at least once at the end when you have the time to drop the fatigue after, right? Because if we have a deload after, we can do all kinds of crazy shit in the last week and not really care. So we have a whole week to drop off the fatigue. Check. Every single box is checked. That's a pretty good way to go about it. Now, can you weave in more failure training than that if you want? Some people say, well, what about like accessory movements like cable bicep curls? Can't I just go to failure on those all the time? Probably because you're only going to get fatigued so much. But I would encourage people to think about it another way. If you don't have a lot of time to train and you can't generate huge volumes because you simply don't have enough time, like if you train four days a week, you can train closer to failure and even take some accessory movements all the way to failure because you're not too worried about fatigue. It's context dependent. If you're really pushing close to your MRV, right, if you're doing a lot of training, you're going to have to stick further away from failure at the beginning of a mental cycle because you're simply going to run aground. So when people say, well, can't I just do my bicep curls to failure because who cares? Well, if you are a really high level, trying to do really high level physique training, you have a total of 20 sets of bicep curls to do per week. You can't afford to go to failure because whatever you do Monday is going to fuck your Wednesday up and then you're not going to be able to produce an overload because you'll be too fatigued. But if you do a total of eight sets of bicep curls a week, your body can potentially recover from as many as 20. Fuck yeah. The whole mess cycle, you can take all of them to failure and be just fine. So a big question about going to failure or not is the context of how much fatigue can you tolerate? If it's a huge amount of fatigue within the context of your program, you can train to failure or closer to failure much more than the average person. If you're really pushing it, you got to make sure to say failure only for strategic times when you don't have to perform in the weeks after. Excellent. That was a great... Uh great explanation on how to use it as a tool now another thing that um it's very typical for a lot of bodybuilders to do especially if you watch a lot of uh, these uh, pro bodybuilders videos is a lot of them seem to do partial reps uh, especially if you watch all videos from ronnie coleman when he's doing the bench press and uh, stuff like that 
Is that more optimal for muscle growth compared to going through a uh, full range of motion when you're lifting? Yeah, so we can take this from a couple of perspectives. First of all, there's kind of a narrative that people have been pushing that says all pro bodybuilders do partial reps. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the guys from Oxygen Gym, by the way, they're currently the best bodybuilders in the world. They're doing really full range of motion all the time. And it's refreshing to see, right? Um, so, and there's a lot of really good bodybuilders that train fundamentally with a pretty full range of motion. I follow a ton of these people on Instagram. The meme of the real partial range of motion bodybuilder is a little bit exaggerated because we like to focus on it, right? So bodybuilders at the pro level are actually split pretty evenly between people who do pretty dedicated to full ranges of motion and individuals who at charitably could be doing a fuller range of motion. The next thing we need to ask is why are they doing partial ranges of motion? There's this idea, and it's an okay idea, but it has its limitations, that anything a pro bodybuilder does or a good athlete does is for the purpose of optimality because on a sort of a blank slate approach, they think it's the best way to do things, all situations being equal. That's not really the case. For example, if you take a high volume of anti-estrogenic compounds, when do most of these bodybuilders release their training footage? When they're dieting for a contest? Their estrogen at this point is damn near close to zero in the several weeks leading out because they have to dry out. You have very low estrogen. Your joints are fucking killing you, especially at extreme ranges of motion, especially at lockout. You don't lock out your elbows when you're on letrozole for four weeks and you can't, you know what I'm saying? You can't even climb the stairs and lock out your knees anymore. So you're going to be training in an altered fashion. If somebody comes up to you and be like, why aren't you locking out? If they're your friend and you talk about drugs with them, you're going to be like, because I'm on fucking Letro. What do you think? But if YouTube people ask, they're going to be like, I feel the muscle more or something. I don't know. Or they'll say, like, it's for safety, right? But if they don't even think it's for safety. It's for safety when your joints are dry as shit, totally. But it's not all the time. Um, another factor, a lot of bodybuilders who are pro bodybuilders, the only reason they're pro is because they've trained hard for 10, 15, 20 years. Some of them trained hard in a really wrong ways and are beat up to shit. If we ever have like a, ask an a AMA with a pro bodybuilder, be like, can you list the number of injuries you've had over the years? They'd be like, look, I don't have that much time. I've broken every fucking thing. You can say everything snapped off the bone. A lot of bodybuilders train with a partial range of motion in a lot of movements because they're simply too fucked up to do a full range of motion, right? Like a lot of individuals have asked me like, Mike, you know, I've seen you post a lot of squatting stuff. Why don't you ever post deadlift stuff? I don't deadlift anymore because I'm too fucking broken to deadlift. Does that mean I don't think deadlifts are a good idea? No way. I built 90% of my back size with deadlifts. But you can't just go assuming I don't like deadlifts. Like, I've literally seen people on forums be like, Dr. Mike doesn't seem to deadlift, so I don't think it's worth it. I'm like, oh my God, fuck, don't say that, <laughs> right? So all that stuff aside, we're really dealing with a very small minority of people that actually think very truncated range of motion is the best possible way to train, right? What do I think about that? I think it's mostly wrong. When we inherit training practices from even the best people in the world, we have to look at it through a historical lens. If you looked at what bodybuilders were doing in the 60s, the best in the world, how much were they making as far as mistakes? Oh my God, a ton. Like we look at their training now, it's fucking laughable. Like some of the shit they were doing is completely ridiculous. In all sports, right? In the 60s, training was terrible. In the uh, NFL in the United States and national football, the average offensive lineman used to weigh in the 1960s about 225 pounds, about 100 kilos. Um, the current offensive lineman weighs about 150 kilos. So why? Because they didn't lift weights because they thought it was going to make you slow. So imagine arguing with someone in the 60s about lifting weights for American football and be like, it's really good. I promise. They'd be like, that's ridiculous. The best guys don't do it. Is that an argument? Yes. It is a very powerful argument. Yes. Is it an untouchable argument? No. So I think a lot of the reason that the people who do partial range of motions defend them is because they're men. They're males and on a lot more testosterone than normal males. They're egotistical motherfuckers that like to fucking bang weights and stack plates and fucking lift heavy shit. And they figure out that they can lift more shit if it's partial range of motion, right? This is what they fucking do. So are these hyper-intelligent training scientists from another dimension that are totally ego-free? No. Some of the ones that are more ego-free do full ranges of motion, are doing more controlled reps, and there are a lot of the older ones that are already too fucked up even to do partial ranges of motion, right? So, so you know, after we get through all that stuff, you know, a question, is there a physiological rationale to believing that partial ranges of motion are good? Uh, what is the physiological rationale? The most common one that people say is you can use more uh, weight, right? Uh, Juma, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the most common thing you've heard? Like as a, 
as an argument for partial range of motion. Yeah, and that you can keep more tension on the muscle uh-huh. in the area. Sounds great. We'll take care of both. The uh, most weight, uh, you, why, so first of all, the first question is why not just alter the repetition range and put more weight on the bar? So if you want to use to put more force through the quads, why don't you just do sets of six instead of sets of 12 with a partial range of motion using the same weight, but now through a full range of motion? Secondly, muscular forces and joint forces are determined a lot by limb ratios and leverage uh, a- as well as the external load. If you go through a full range of motion in a squat with 100 kilos, it's as much force on the quadriceps at various points, even more than a partial range of motion with 180 kilos, right? Like as you go to failure and you're squeezing out of the bottom of the squat from a super deep squat, you are producing as much force via the musculature as you ever would be with 180 kilos in a half squat, right? So we got a really big, so uh, an extended range of motion actually results in more force production. So, uh, uh, so that's the first part. Second part is what is the advantage of using heavier weights? Past about the 8RM zone, anything heavier simply doesn't help hypertrophy. And it just doesn't. It's been tested to the ground. Volume is king after you do enough intensity. Even sets of 20 reps, if you push close to failure, and if you do enough volume, are equivalent to hypertrophy of sets of you know 8 reps. If anyone tells you you got to train heavier than an 8RM full range of motion lift, they're just wrong, right? So if someone's like, well, I want to use more weight. Why? You're just trying to fuck up your joints more? Like, why don't you use more weight than you can even lift? Why don't you do eccentric overloads where you put 1,500 kilos on the squat and just have it squash you down and then somebody picks you up and it's just, why don't you get into car accidents all the time, run into the street, get hit by a car, and hell hold of a lot of force that just doesn't, it, it, there's a point at which more weight simply doesn't help. So that's the, that's the force arguments. Constant tension. You want to fuck people up uh, psychologically, you want to you want to tune them up a little bit. Anytime someone mentions constant tension, you just only have to ask them one thing: which is what is the advantage of constant tension? Because most people know that again as a meme. Constant tension, bro. Constant tension. Constant tension. You keep constant tension. Don't fucking look up, brother. You're not keeping constant tension on the muscle, bro. You'd be like, why should I keep constant tension? All of a sudden, 99 percent of the people that say that are like, because it's fucking what you're supposed to do, bro. They're like, but why? They're like. I don't fucking know. Like, I don't know. Then, then they say, because you want the muscle to feel it. You're like, right. So if I do uh, 10 reps in the squat, never locking out and, and, and uh, always keeping constant tension, if you let me lock out, I can rest at the top for a bit and get 15 reps in the squat. The total amount of tension generated is the same or even higher with the 15 reps. So what am I losing? And they'll be like, well, you're letting the muscle rest. Well, guess what, motherfucker? You rest between sets. How's that different? Well, can you imagine someone's like, we're going to do four sets of 10 in the squat? And be like, that's bullshit. Let's just do 40 reps. Be like, what? Why would you do that? Be like, constant tension, bro. Why rest between sets? They'd be like, that doesn't make any sense. They'd be like, neither does fucking constant tension, right? Muscles grow primarily from the total amount of physical work that they do. So first of all, the full range of motion helps that right? Because it's physically more work, more distance displaced. And second of all, splitting it up any old way you want is probably totally fine. If you lock out your reps and rest between it, like on a leg press, for example, you can just get more reps. 10 reps is 10 reps. It doesn't really matter how much constant tension it is. Now, there's a small, small bit of thing. There is a metabolite question. Metabolites probably contribute to hypertrophy a small amount. If you do constant tension, you can sequester more metabolites in the muscle without letting them leach out into the blood, disturbing that sequestration of metabolites, and and you get that advantage. But that really only applies to very high rep sets, and you're under the understanding that you're okay with doing less work because you want the metabolite response. After you put in your compound heavy basic work, then you might say, okay, the next exercise is just for metabolites. We're going to focus on constant tension. That's one way of getting metabolites. Notice you don't have to focus on concentration for metabolites. You can do set of 10, lock it out, wait for three seconds, a set of five, lock it out. And that's not constant tension. You're taking breaks. That's a great way of summing metabolites. But if you want to sum metabolites in such a way that limits the volume as much as possible, but elevates the metabolites as much as possible, constant tension is great. Notice we've taken constant tension. It's still an extent variable. It still does that, what I just said pretty well, but what percent of training is that circumstance? Now, I'll repeat the circumstance. The goal is to generate metabolites, and you want to do it in as little volume as possible. That's like 5% of all training. And when you're doing that, totally cool. But every other time, probably a waste of time. So I, uh, constant tension for those listening, if you want some interesting ideas, maybe I didn't cover something, next time someone says, do constant tension, ask them why. You'll get uh, – hilarity will ensue. Excellent. Now, 
let's move over to some questions on uh, on nutrition. Um, I know that you're uh, a big fan of um, periodizing, massing, dieting, and maintenance phases. So uh, my understanding is that you don't really like to have longer ex- extended times where you're massing, and you also like to incorporate uh, periods where you're maintaining. Could you explain a bit about that? Yeah, so I think that you know, there's a couple of problems that result from excessive durations of massing. One problem is that you get really fat and then your partitioning ratios go to hell. And also you got really fat, so you just have to burn off the fat at some point. You've like accumulated a debt of fat. Um, and, and if you lower your rate of massing, that's no longer a big problem. So that problem can be solved. So if you just go slower, then you can mass for longer. The next big limiting factor that I'm concerned about is if you chronically train with high volumes, the kind of volumes that optimize hypertrophy, at some point your body probably becomes a little bit less sensitive, maybe much more sens- le- much less sensitive to high volume training. You accumulate a lot of fatigue, a lot of resistance to volume. And when that occurs, what's going to happen is you're going to have to take a break from training for high volumes for probably several weeks, low volume training to basically let your body become sensitive to muscle mass gains again from high volume training. How do you know this? Can you still see me, by the way? Yeah. Okay, sweet. So, um, cool. I'm on a. I just got a call on my iPhone for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, you can't consistently put out super high volumes of training without taking breaks every now and again. I'm of the opinion, that from from real world observation, that if something between three and six months six months for more beginners and three or less for advanced athletes is the most you can sustain truly high volume training for. After that, you need at least a couple of weeks, maybe like a month of much lower volume training to get your body back into the groove for high volume training. Um, almost all body processes have this sort of desensitization, resensitization. For example, in a fat loss diet, if someone told you you could do fat loss for like six months straight, what would you tell them? You'd be like, you're nuts. That's not a good idea. You need a maintenance phase in there or mass phase or something to get the body to calm down all of its anti-fat loss me- me- uh, you know, mechanisms so that you can breathe again and then go into another section. So I think the same thing applies from a mass gaining perspective just for different reasons. So I think um, if you can gain for three to six months, that's probably pretty good. And then after that, you want a maintenance phase if for no nutritional reason, just the reason of you can't sustain high volume training for that long and benefit from it. One of the ways you know in which is there fiber type alterations, there's fatigue accumulation. Um, one of the ways you probably can tell from an intuitive perspective if you're training for high volumes for too long, if you're no longer getting pumps from the normal volumes of training you used to and you just feel fatigued after training instead of like jacked up that's probably a good sign that you're doing a little too much volume and you need to back away from it. After you do a lower volume phase, you come back to higher volumes and the first workout, you get this crazy like skin bursting pump and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I can't believe sets of 10 are fucking me up this bad. That's a good sign. But if you're doing sets of 10 and you just feel depleted and tired afterwards, you probably are, are converted to more slow twitch muscle fiber type. You've probably sort of run aground on your anabolic pathways and, and now you're just kind of spinning your wheels. Um, there's some research and in, in, in sort of related avenues that shows that if you consistently do a lot of workload, high activity, uh, you know, at first your anabolic stimuli are more powerful than catabolic. But if you keep up high volume training for long enough, the catabolic stimuli start to rise until they more or less cancel out your anabolic. You wouldn't want to train to spin our wheels. Every now and again, it's probably good to come back to a lower volume phase. It doesn't need to be forever. Probably a couple of weeks is good. If you try to gain through those phases, what do we have? We have a maintenance level of training with a hypercaloric diet. That's a recipe for fat gains. So at that point, you, by definition, have to stop your mass phase, go on a maintenance diet, and then once the mass phase is done, maybe you can cut a little body fat and go back in to to, uh, massing, or you can just start massing again. Um, Either way, I think, is better than just continuing to try to spin your wheels with training and gaining for a very long time. Now, Now, here's the thing. I don't have like a, a horse in the race, so to speak, on this. I don't want the reality to be a certain thing. If I did, I'd want to be able to gain for 8, 
12, 15. I want fucking mass forever, dude. Fuck that. I hate maintenance phases. It's fucking annoying. You barely train at all. You train like heavyweights and you don't get a pump anymore. You're not gaining any weight. You look like shit because you're, you're not pumped anymore, but your body fat's the same. So you look smaller and fatter. Um, it's kind of like, it seems like a waste of time is just something that my reading of the literature, my coaching of clients and, and my analysis, my own results is something that has to be done every now and again. It's pain. It's like, um, it's like weekends to the work week. If you're really passionate about your career, you never want to have weekends. You want to just fucking work, work, work and do great shit. But then you like have a nervous breakdown. You don't know where the fuck you are. So you're like, okay, I'm going to start to take vacations and weekends every now and again. So that doesn't happen. Right. Or I'm losing sleep. Same idea. That That's my approach to the, the mass phasing. Uh, and, and maintenance. And sometimes I think you may be able to throw mini cuts in there, right? So you mass for a while and then you do a little mini cut and you mass for a while and a mini cut. And on the mini cut, you train with lower volumes, just enough to not lose muscle. And then you mass again. I think that's a pretty good kind of, uh, sort of like a zigzag effect to get you the results you want. I just don't think that there are a lot of body processes that you can do for very long without suffering negative feedback loop effects. Excellent. Now, Another question that um, I have regarding uh, something that uh, a lot of bodybuilders will say is mixing carbs and fats in a meal. Is there anything to that that that's probably not a good idea or it doesn't really matter as long as you keep your protein high enough and your calories in check? Yeah, well, so, so that, that, um, that idea almost certainly either came from or gained the most ground during uh, what we now live in is the insulin era um, of pro bodybuilding or just not drug-free bodybuilding. When you're injecting insulin, it is usually um, to create a very anti-catabolic and very anabolic condition in, in conjunction with other substance use. When you inject insulin, you have to have a high volume of carbohydrates in the digestive tract or in the blood already, ready to enter the blood or ready to enter the cells. Otherwise, you go hypoglycemic, your blood sugar drops, and you fucking die, or you know, just at, at the very least, you know, pass out or something like that. The thing about taking in carbohydrates is if you take them in with a low fat amount, they digest quickly. They are very readily available to be put into the cell and put into the blood. So if you concurrently inject insulin with carbohydrates, if they're very low in fat, it's a very easy thing to do. The match is one-to-one. There's not really a big chance of hypoglycemia, et cetera. If you consume lots of fats with carbohydrates, fats do two things. They delay the digestion of carbohydrates, so the carbs don't even start leaking into the blood until an hour later. If you shoot insulin and then you eat fatty carbs, you will fucking die before the carbs get into your blood, right? There's no saving you mm-hmm. short of like giving you an injection of glucose at the hospital or something like that. Um, and the second part is they um, – Fats uh, slow the absorption of carbohydrates into the blood. So you shot a bunch of insulin, a certain number of units of insulin to transport a certain amount of carbohydrate per minute into the cell, and all of a sudden your rate of carbohydrate delivery into the blood is half that because the fats are slowing it down, again in the same bit of trouble. Uh, Probably another additional concern is if you're injecting insulin and there is a lot of fat in your diet at the time in which your serum insulin is high – Insulin is incredibly adipogenic, right? So if you have fats coming in and insulin is high, they're just going to go right into fat, right into the fat cells. It's going to make you a fat piece of shit. And it's not going to maximize that huge glycemic carbohydrate and glycogen-based response that we're looking for for injecting insulin. Because those are all realities for insulin-using bodybuilders, where you know we hear these things like you shouldn't eat carbs and fats at the same time, which are totally true for the insulin injection window for pro bodybuilders that use insulin. Absolutely. For drug-free bodybuilders, it's almost completely a moot point. So here's what happens. If you eat carbs and fats at the same time and you naturally produce insulin, guess what? Your body's really smart. It produces just as much insulin at just enough of a rate to equal what you're getting into the blood. So if you eat a lot of fats with carbs, the entry of carbohydrate into the blood is very slow. Your body secretes very little insulin. One-to-one match, no big deal. If you eat a lot of carbohydrates without much fat, you get a lot of carbs in the blood all at once and a lot of insulin secretion by the pancreas. Problem solved. Are there times when mixing carbs and fats are not a good idea? Yeah, but it's not because it's a magical mixing problem. It's because you need the carbs faster. For example, if you have training in two hours and you want a lot of blood glucose and a top off your glycogen stores, if you eat a shitload of fat with those carbs, 
they're just not even going to start digesting until you're like 30 minutes before training. You can like eat, eating a huge burrito with a ton of guacamole and cheese right before you train with squats. You're just going to throw up a lot, right? Because you're just going to be in your stomach still. On the other hand, if you're post-workout, especially if you train multiple times a day, you're post-workout and you want to replenish glycogen quickly, you want the most insulin, you want the least delay because remember, muscles are more sensitive to glycogen repletion within half hour, hour, two hours after training than they are later. So you want less fat just because you don't want that delay. Nothing magical. It's just a matter of timing. But if you have like, let's say it's 6 p.m., you train to 12 p.m., you're already not in any kind of you know uh, super absorptive window. You got 50 grams of carbohydrates left for the day and you've got 50 grams of fat. Can you mix them together in one meal? Oh, my God, totally. It's not a big deal at all. Excellent. Now, my next question is regarding when you're when you're cutting. Do you feel that refeeds, cheat meals, cheat days serve a, serve a purpose? Do, like, do they help with uh, with fat loss in any way, or is it mostly to give you a break from from your diet? Yeah. So, um, I think it's important to distinguish planned refeeds from just a pulsatile introduction of food and carbohydrate into the diet based on training day type. So for example, on days in which you have a high level of physical activity and you have a whole lot of training going on, you should probably be eating more carbohydrate. On days in which you are, have a little, a, a little uh, you know, much less training and days in which you have much less uh, physical activity, you probably uh, can lower your carbohydrate considerably without suffering any ill effects. That tends to give you a caloric pulsatility and a carbohydrate pulsatility throughout the week, some days that are higher, some days that are lower, that probably has some beneficial hormonal effects from keeping you more uh, anti-catabolic on average and less likely to descend into the sort of hormonal pits of hunger where you're just catabolic all the time, you're super hungry. Because like on leg day, you get more food, it sort of quiets the hormones for uh, maybe a day or two after, and then you know you have another leg day, and then you have more food, et cetera. So the pulsatility is good. Uh, so that is that definitely works. Um, the next question is: Is anything above that a really good idea? So like randomly, you have an off day in the week where you eat like 600 grams of carbohydrates, and all the other days you eat 200. What does that do? It loads you with glycogen, but does it load you in any better way than just adding all those carbs, spreading them out throughout the week? No, I would actually argue worse. You should just time them with the workout windows of all the other training days throughout the week. Um, secondly, does it have any magical effect on hormones? All the literature I've read has not led me to believe that that is the case. In fact, all of the beneficial hormonal – metabolism will go faster. Hormones that, are, uh, you know, that generate hunger and all this other stuff will decline. Hormones that burn muscle will decline, but they decline proportionately to the amount of carbohydrates you ate for the proportionate amount of time that they're being digested and processed. The next day that you wake up, you're not eating more carbs. Within a couple of meals after, you're going to be just as catabolic as you ever were and all that other shit, right? So uh, is it worth it eating that many more calories and delaying your fat loss because you eat so many more calories? Do you get any kind of super physiological boost? I would say the answer is no. Can you intelligently use refeeds to really quiet the waters of these um, sort of really negative adaptations to, to excessive fat loss dieting? Yes. But the, in my view, they have to be longer. A week at the shortest, probably like two to four weeks. So is it logical to diet hard for six weeks and then take like a two to four week quote unquote diet break? We're still eating clean, all this other stuff. You're still watching calories, but you eat at a maintenance level to really cool the fires and then start back into a diet again? Totally. That's a real refeed. Um, anything else, I think if you refeed for like a day during the week, it just doesn't make any fucking sense because it doesn't, it's not enough time for all that stuff to really reverse. If it was, I would be an advocate of it. It's really fun. Um, Cheat meals. You don't really get much out of loading fat anyway, and cheat meals are usually high fat, so it's fucking stupid. Um, cheat days are just a, a, a recipe for reversing almost every benefit of caloric reduction that you have during the week. I know people that can do things on cheat days that don't make any damn sense. I met a very nice lady uh, a couple of weeks ago that says that when she has a cheat day, she dips Oreo cookies in full cream. Cream, not milk, cream. That's some next level shit. That's like pissing away a week of dieting. Like you do, you eat two or three meals like that during a cheat day. And there's your whole hypercaloric condition. And what is the advantage? I'm not sure. I will tell you that there is a big disadvantage. Here it is. Psychologically, you spend so much of your week looking forward to the cheat meal. You have to create such a huge deficit to counterbalance it to continue to lose fat that you're suffering way more during the week. 
And then when you eat your cheat meal, you, it's never enough or it's your cheat day. It's never enough and or it's too much. You get bloated. You get sick. And then you go back through the wash, back through the cycle. I would prefer a much more even approach, reducing calories steadily, having a good amount of food throughout the week. And if needed, when needed, taking entire several week-long breaks from dieting into maintenance phases and then doing sequential dieting like that. I'm much more of a fan of doing an eight-week diet, a four-week diet break, and then another eight-week diet versus a 16-week all the way straight through diet. Excellent. Now, before we wrap it up, I have one final question. For for someone that's starting out with with uh, with bodybuilding, what would be your best advice? Starting out with bodybuilding, focus on getting stronger in the 5 to 15 rep range with the compound heavy basics, pull-ups, shoulder presses, bench presses, squats, lunges, deadlifts, rows, things like that. Focus on having you know, uh, three to six months periods where you gain maybe about half a pound to a pound a week and then juxtapose those with maybe one to two month fat loss periods where you lose maybe about a pound per week of total weight. And you can repeat that process that I just described while trying to get stronger on those lifts. Um, for several years and it's going to build you a great foundation you're going to learn a ton about your body and then you'll know enough hopefully you're doing your reading reading you know good books looking at good sources um and, and you'll know a lot of stuff by then to where you can make things more complicated use some of the cool fancy tricks and actually benefit from it excellent thank you so much uh, mike for taking the time to do this podcast it's always a pleasure to have you on and i could I can literally spend hours talking to you about uh, several things, but I know that uh, you have some uh, obligations that you need to get to. So uh, before we wrap it up, where can people find more information about you? Well, I can talk to you for hours too, so it's a bad, bad recipe. <laughs> um, I think just for the record, I think you're a phenomenal interviewer. Um, Thank you so uh, much. People can find me. Um, you know what I'm saying? Come to my block. Find me. You want to find me? Come in person. You know, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you want to fight me, please don't. I'll run away. Um, RP at RP D R M I K E on Instagram. If you want to stuff much cooler than that, at RP Strength on Instagram. That's the company that I helped co found. Way bigger Instagram, a lot more cool stuff. A lot of very attractive people in our photos, uh, real actual results. Um, and then Mike Israel on Facebook. Facebook's doing this thing now where it's all like viral videos and some stupid shit. So my posts you'll barely ever see. <laughs> Yahoo, I'm usually making formative posts. I'm going to try making more videos though. Stay in the loop. So uh, that's the best way to track me down. Excellent, Mike. Thank you so much again for your time and uh, wishing you a further pleasant day. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.